process of economic development. Okay, very good. Welcome. All right, so let's going to introduce ourselves. We come uh, a long way. Uh, in my case, I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. My name is Javier Villegas. I work for Mediterranean Shipping Company as IT director in the um, database and BI services area. Uh, I am uh, Microsoft MVP in the data platform category since 2016. Microsoft certified trainer and also uh, same as Gaston, uh, members of the board of advisor of the Azure data community, right? Uh, well, he's gonna introduce himself in a minute, but we also ran uh, a show in LATAM called Azure en el bar, Azure at the bar that we started in the uh, pandemic. So, you know, we just have a lot of fun together with some other college and, and people uh, talking about uh, technology as an excuse, but we always try to imagine that we are all sitting together in a bar, just drinking and, and, and talking. So that, that's a good uh, initiative that we are working uh, together. So you want to introduce yourself? That sounds good. Uh, thank you, Shoveda. Um, my name is Gaston Cruz. I'm from Uruguay, South America, but I'm now living in Bellevue, next to the Microsoft office. No? Uh, I am director for the Microsoft Center of Excellence Slalom Consulting. Um, Microsoft MVP, as Javier, we met in Secret Saturdays, Chile, a long time ago. Uh, I've been running community engagements for a long time in LATAM. I, I am trying, based on Bellevue, to kind of link in headquarters for Microsoft, product teams from Microsoft. I've been working closely with Power BI team, with the Synapse team right now and trying to engage them, the product teams with LATAM user groups, leaders across Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, trying to kind of grab a little bit of, you know, that link in between what is the roadmap, feedbacks, what we've been hearing from clients in terms of, you know, using our products across Microsoft and trying to get up to speed in terms of what is going to be next in terms of SQL and apps, Power BI and the what we call right now the data intelligence platform. We are here with Javier with a little bit of mixing between the SQL DBI world and the more the data analytics side of things. So we are going to try to cross path and that is the main goal of this presentation today, trying to kind of get the sense of end-to-end -end solution in the data intelligence platform space. That is going to be our goal today. I'm Microsoft MVP also, and I'm really happy to be here again in person in some, in some way. I have been kind of trying to get that, that sense again to have community engagements. Excellent. So we name this uh, session, this talk, Discovering Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform, right? We know that recently, during the last uh, Microsoft Bill uh, event, a few months ago, there were a lot of announcements like, uh, like usual, uh, but one of them is this concept of intelligent data platform, which at the end of the day is like Microsoft putting all together in, in the same box, several product and services that were you know, in different areas, all of them under the data platform, um, umbrella, but now with a little bit more or organization. Just going from the operational side, right? SQL Server, uh, Cosmos DB, and everything that is related to the relational and non-relational operation to the analytics, right? With uh, Synapse, with Power BI, and those kind of product and services. And also they added this important layer that is data governance, right? These days with the lot of, with the amount of data that we are dealing with, right? We definitely need data discovery and governance to understand a little bit more what we have, right? Because then uh, we end up on a project that we are trying to look for uh, business information in multiple places and we have no catalog. So the idea today is go to some of these uh, 
product and services, right? Not all of them, and try to cover the most important. We come up with some sort of short agenda uh, to give it an idea of, of a correlation of what we would like to do, right? So we may skip the break, maybe. So the idea is to start talking a little bit about Azure SQL, right? From the operational standpoint, what it is, uh, you know, what is the difference between the SQL Server that we all know and been using since SQL Server 6.0, maybe in my case, until you know the SQL Server virtual machines, managed instance, and and those kind of things. Really, really interesting uh, topic. Then we will cover also the recently announced SQL Server 2022, which uh, is still in preview, right? It was announced last year, and since uh, a month plus ago, it's now in public preview, so everybody can, can download it and test it. So we're going to go through it with all the new features. Uh, then Gaston will take over and will show us uh, a little bit about this technology called Azure Synapse Analytics, which is quite interesting, and how it is being integrated with Power BI. Right? So let's move on. Let me jump to the actual presentation. All right, here we go. Th these are a set of presentation that we've been delivering uh, during the last few years, I would say. Um, trying to you know, merge them all together, same as the intelligent data platform. So this part is introduction to Azure SQL and try to understand what it is. Well, this is again my bio. This is a quite interesting slide because it's actually a marketing slide is not technical, but I believe that it represents quite well what Azure SQL means. Right? Again, there is this concept of SQL Server and what is different between SQL Server and, and Azure SQL. So, first of all, Azure SQL is a combination of product and services related to SQL Server in the Microsoft Cloud Azure. Right? And what do we have here? We have four components today, right? One of them over there is Azure SQL Virtual Machines. Azure SQL Virtual Machines are basically virtual machines created in Azure, right, from a template, right, in where we can install SQL Server. The same SQL Server that we download from, you know, the, the evaluation site, and then we install it in our servers, in our laptops, exactly the same. But there is an important benefit of using this virtual machine. First of all, when we deploy these virtual machines, when we have it installed, right? first of all, it's, it's extremely easy, right? It's in, in a few minutes, we can have a, a, a very robust SQL Server running, right? But most of the best practices that we've been learning over the years, right, are already part of this deployment without us having to do any, let's say, post-installation thing, right? So we have this in this virtual machine. Really interesting, really powerful. And then we're going to be talking about uh, scalability uh, and, 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 and infrastructure and a few other things. But uh, you know, this is the main concept, Azure SQL virtual machines. Then there are two components in between. These are managed instance, Azure SQL managed instance and Azure SQL database, right? This is basically, imagine SQL Server as a service, right? So you don't have to worry about what is the infrastructure behind the scene, what Microsoft is giving you in the cloud is a SQL Server endpoint, right? So you connect with your management studio, with your application server, your web server, you deploy your databases, and that's it. You don't want to know what is behind the scenes. And what is the benefit? You know, this is what, what Microsoft call it, 
platform as a service, right? So you don't have to worry about the high availability disaster recovery. You don't have to worry about patching, um, you know, integration with your Active Directory, those things that from the on-premise world or, you know, from the, the other concept, infrastructure as a service, we need to take care of, right? So again, it's an endpoint that we connect and we use, right? It's an interesting uh, concept which is becoming more and more popular. Now the question is, why do we have two, right? This is not SQL Server as a service. Well, the answer is that it's not exactly SQL Server as a service. Manage Instance, which is the one which is more similar to, to, to SQL Server, in where we will see that we have the SQL Server Asian and all the features that we've been using forever, right? It's not 100% compatible. There are few things that are not available, but they may come eventually. But then there is this other component, which is Azure SQL Database. Azure SQL Database was uh, one of the first services that were created in Azure when it was announced back on you know, several years ago, more than 10 years ago. Of course, the product has evolved a lot. So what is Azure SQL Database? And what is the difference with Managed Instance and eventually SQL Server? Basically, it is more targeted to modern applications. And why is that? Well, the first important concept that we have to take with Azure SQL Database is that everything has to live within the same user database. Logins, tables, procedures, et cetera. If you remember on SQL Server, you may have you know, one user database or multiple user database within the same instance, and you can have a store procedure that go and check or do a join with tables in different user databases. In Azure SQL Database, it's not possible. Everything has to live on the same database. Is this a limitation? I would say no. It's a characteristic of the service, right? Of course, there are pros and cons, and there are you know, other components that allow us to do the same, like managed instance, as I mentioned before. These are the three most important components of the Azure SQL family, right? We're going to go in deep a little bit in a in, in few moments, right? And we will see how to deploy them in Azure. We will see that it's quite easy. Then there is a fourth component here, which is the, you know, the, the, the new guy in the family, right? Is Azure SQL Edge, right? What is this? Well, basically, is to give us the possibility of running SQL Server on an ARM device, right? Like, for example, a Raspberry Pi, big like this, right? You can have the same SQL Server that you use with the same T-SQL code that you've been using forever in a Raspberry Pi, right? Of course, we won't put our mission-critical decision-making application databases warlock on it. But for several uh, scenarios, like for example, capturing information from the sensors in, in, in a field, right? Capturing, storing it, processing, and even doing some uh, you know, machine learning processes on it is possible. Right? So definitely a, a good uh, a good component or a new addition to the Azure SQL family. We won't be covering it much today. Uh, so we will focus a little bit more on the first three components. But, you know, as Microsoft like to say, it's just SQL, right? Everything that we have learned over the years in terms of how to administer, how to manage, how to write code, etc., is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So these are the three main components. The first one, the virtual machines, enters in the bucket called infrastructure as a service, right? And then the other bucket in where we have the other two components is platform as a service, as I said earlier. Infrastructure as a service, we need to take care of everything. Same as we do today in our on-premise environment. If we need to set up high availability or a disaster recovery, we have to go uh, and rent, you know, an internet connection, get another data center in a different location, and so on and so forth. 
if we need to do the backup, we need to take care of doing the backup, storing uh, and having a backup policy. Uh, if we need to apply patches like Windows patches or I won't say Windows, operating system patches or SQL patches, we need to take care of the maintenance window, a schedule, the, you know, the validation, the, the maintenance window, I was just doing it, right? So let's say nothing changed to what we've been doing today, right? It's a virtual machine with certain, you know, specification. The good thing is up in Azure, right? But again, if we need to uh, do high availability, we have to manually create the clusters and those kind of things. In the manage uh, in, in the platform as a service scenario, as I said, we have this two component manage instance, which is quite close to SQL Server and Azure SQL database. Right? Each of them has its own, um, you know, specifications and tiers. We will go through that in in, in a little bit more. Right? Um, and the good thing is that Microsoft is investing and investing a lot on this component in all the Azure regions that they have all around the world, right? There are certain things that we can do with one, but not with the other, as I mentioned before. But again, essentially, it's just SQL, right? So we mentioned about, we, we talk about infrastructure as a service and platform as a services. If we, as you know, we're supposed to go to this platform as a service world because ideally, who, who won't like to have our SQL Server databases in kind of autopilot without worrying about patching, without worrying about, you know, backups and, and those kind of things. I, I would say everybody. And which are the main uh, hotspots of, of this concept, right? First of all, Business continuity, high availability is something that in these services, as I said earlier, is out of the box. When we deploy it, right, Microsoft tells us that we have a, a certain numbers of nines in terms of SLAs. We can go through that uh, in, 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 in a couple of slides. Right? But whatever is related to business continuity is something that Microsoft is taking care for us. Automated backup long-term backup retention and geo replication. Today, if we have to take care of the backup policies, right? We know that even if, you know, especially if we are trying to certify in any ISO uh, certification, there are certain things that we have to, to follow, right? We don't only need to take the backups, right? We need to store it. We need to store it for a certain amount of time. And we need to store it in a specific location, which of course is not the same location in where we have our source data, right? Well, in, in Azure, we have all that covered, right? As part of the service, right? Microsoft take the backups for us, any flavor of backup you imagine, full backup, differential, transactional, and you can have it she replicated in multiple Azure regions. So eventually, on a big outage of find a specific Azure region, you will have your backups available on a different. So the part that I like the most, scalability, right? In any of these three components that I mentioned, if you want to scale your horsepower, right, you can do it in few clicks. Imagine this scenario. In the on-premise world, when you have to, you know, uh, do the architectural part for your application, your database, you will come up with a, a specification for a server, right? Certain amount of cores, CPUs, this kind of disk, uh, this performance, etc. Then let's say that one day your business is doing really good and you may need to scale more resources in your SQL Server. What do you need to do? Well, first of all, call the vendor, find out if the hardware is available, buy the hardware, schedule the maintenance window to do it, and that will take at least a couple of weeks. Right? In the Azure SQL world, if we need to scale, right, 
giving, for example, additional CPU, more memory, more disk, faster disk, etc. It's a matter of three, four clicks. Right? We do it right away and we can scale up at any time. Right? And eventually we can scale down if we have to. Especially in the platform as a service world, we have this concept of, you know, for example, you have your Azure SQL database that is part of a e-commerce solution. And you have, for example, a seasonal event like Christmas or, or you know, any important day in where your uh, sales uh, ramp, right? And you will need more for powers. You can easily scale temporary, right? Your solution to have more horsepower, and then when it's end, you can lower it down again with the three, four clicks, right? This happened in a virtual machine, in managed instance, or in Azure SQL database. It's really simple, the scalability part. Security, extremely important, especially these days, right? The Microsoft Azure infrastructure give you all you need in terms of security with additional services like, for example, um, ATP, Azure Threat Protection, uh, and there are other services that, for example, are scanning your SQL Server workload, and if they, if they detect any anomaly or, or, or something that they believe it could be a warning in terms of security, it will let you know right away. Versionless, super important in managed instance and Azure SQL database. In the history of SQL Server, we had a bunch of versions. Every time we had to move from one to the other, uh, we have to validate our project to see if it worked with SQL Server 2012 or 2008 or whatever. Azure SQL is versionless, meaning no version. That is that for a managed instance or Azure SQL database, you won't see version one, two, three, four, whatever. It will always be Azure SQL, period. Right? That means that we don't have to go through all this validation. Does it mean that this is a static SQL and it will never have any innovation or something like that? Absolutely not. It's actually the other way around. Right? Microsoft put the innovation in managed instance and Azure SQL database first, and then it moved it to the SQL product, right? And then all the benefit of the Azure monitoring platform as well as the intelligence that we're gonna go through in a minute, right? So all the problems that we may have today in our on-premise infrastructure, like hardware purchasing management, high availability, disaster recovery, everything is covered with Azure SQL database, right? Out of the box. Then Microsoft provides us with a lot of services and tools to migrate our SQL Server on-premise workload to any of the service. So easily we can have a tool and a service that validate our SQL Server databases and will tell us exactly what we need to do to move it to, for example, a managed instance or an Azure SQL database, right? These are products that we download for free and Microsoft every month come up with a new set of rules that will help us to do this migration in a seamless way. Right? So in the uh, SQL, um, SQL virtual machines uh, area, as I said, this is uh, a machine that we've been using forever, but again, with certain things already applied when we do the deployment. As I said at the beginning, it's just SQL. So for the performance standpoint, we have these three important pillars, CPU, memory, or uh, uh, CPU, memory, and IO, right? So this is the same. If we need to maintain certain degree of performance, we always need to focus on these three important things. There is something quite interesting that Microsoft has done for these virtual machines which is what they call um, ephemeral disk, right? Most of these virtual machines, they come with a specific local super fast drive, which is uh, 
let's say, a good fit for what is the SQL Server TEMDB, right? We, we know that is, you know, one of the most important components of SQL and having on a local super fast storage is always a good thing that maybe in, in an on-premise environment is going to take a little bit more time and resources. Um, so manage instance, as I said, quite similar to SQL Server. There are only one main uh, differentiation between one and the other is this feature called file stream file table that we have in SQL Server, but we don't have in managed instance, right? This is basically the possibility of handling files through uh, T-SQL. Um, and, and this is because SQL Server has a lot of control over the, the local storage on the, on the system. In this case, managed instances, this is a, a managed platform. We don't have access to the underlying infrastructure. Microsoft is coming with some sort of, I would say, workaround, um, but that's the main thing that is not present today. Then, beside that, how do we move an, a SQL Server database to a managed instance? As simple as doing a backup restore. Uh, we just take a backup of our SQL Server version, any version, right, starting from 2005, and we restore it to a managed instance. Really really interesting. And then uh, Azure SQL Database, as I said, quite targeted to modern application, right? This concept of having everything uh, tied to a single user database is, uh, you know, this this thing that we is, is maybe a little bit complex to start with, to understand that now everything is, so all my tables, all my logic has to be on the same user database, but as soon as we start working with it, it's, it's, it's a really nice, um, you know, service. So then we have to decide which platform as a service we use, managed instance or Azure SQL database, right? I will say that, you know, when I have someone asking me, what is your recommendation for going to Azure? I would say if you want to go fast, if you want to do it quickly, you just take your databases, you deploy a virtual machine, and you put it there. That's going to be the first step. But then the very same day that you have this running as production, right? the next step should be targeting one of these platforms as a service offering. Right? If you have an application that is already, we can call it, legacy, right, which may have a logic that may require interaction between objects in multiple user databases and those kind of things. And you would like to, you know, have the same control on the SQL Server agent, service broker, SQL replication, this kind of thing that, that we all know and be using forever. Manage instance is, is the destination. But instead, if today you have the requirement of creating a brand new application, right? So today we're going to start a new e-commerce application that will require a relational database as a backend. Managed instance should be your option. All right. You have uh, any question? Wait, first, managed instance is for legacy. Okay. I won't say legacy. It's more similar to your SQL Server, your existing SQL Server, right, where you can have one instance with multiple user databases. Right? The other one, you know, you can migrate anything to anything. Right? But if you have an application that, for example, has three uh, databases with tables in, in all three databases and one store procedure that is showing tables that, that on each user database, you can move it to Azure SQL DB, but you have to do a, a, an interesting engineering part, just moving all the objects to the same user database. I mean, moving tables to different databases, rewriting store procedures, and those kind of things. It's doable. Microsoft helps you with this uh, database migration assistance. But again, I would say that, you know, if you are on this spot, Consider managing instance. It's going to be way easier, right? 
but if you are starting something new, go this way. Okay, so the multiple things. Uh, did they have a, why did they, do they have a preference for you not to have multiple instances with um, stored procedures uh, interacting with the same data? Or uh, they don't do that with the SQL database? No, they don't do that at all here. So you may have one, let's say, virtual server, how they call it, and multiple Azure SQL database on the same instance. But if you will try from one store procedure to access a table that is in another one, you will get a horrible red message saying everything has to be contained on the same user data. Uh, a managed instance is the same as SQL Server today. You can go to any, as long as you have the right permissions, of course, right. uh, you, you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. All right, then how do we, you know, manage all this? We have what is called service tiers. And Gaston, tell me how we're going with the, and, and Rebecca as well, how we're doing with, with the timing. Um, so it is called, for managed instance, we have two, what is called service tiers. By general purpose, where Microsoft said that most of the uh, common business workloads work fine on it. And then there is business critical, in where there is uh, faster storage, uh, because actually it's local, so it's uh, lower latency and, and, and fast recovery. And there is an additional replica for read only workload, uh, if, of course more expensive, but if you need extra performance, especially on the storage side, business critical is, is your choice. Both of them are based on the virtual core model. That means that you will uh, select an amount of virtual cores between two and 80, right? And as I said earlier, if you run out of processing power, you have a very nice slider that you can add more CPU to uh, the solution, right? As I mentioned, general purpose, it use remote storage. That is why it's, let's say, cheaper. And business critical use local storage. With that, we can accomplish better or faster I.O., right? In the Azure SQL world, we have two models. The original one, which was DTU, database transaction unit model. So you had to you know, buy these DTUs and with them you have additional and more powerful storage and more compute. And now Microsoft is recommending to also go to the virtual core model, right? DTU model is still available. So if you go and deploy a new Azure SQL database, you can do it with this model, but Microsoft is recommending this one. And there are also different service tiers. General purpose, as we mentioned before, for managed instance, business critical, and then there is another one called hyperscale, right? In where you can store Azure SQL databases bigger as, you know, you can imagine, 100 terabytes, you name it, right? This is hyperscale in when you can have I would say unlimited storage. Right? If for a specific, you know, type of workload, um, and again, as I said, you can move between one tier to the other. So, how do we connect to Azure SQL? Right? First, or, or the starting point is the Azure portal, and then when our virtual machines, our services are deployed. We do what we do since day one. We connect with Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, and all the connectivity uh, drivers and, and, and clients that we've been using forever, right? Because as I said at the beginning, as Microsoft like to emphasize, it's just SQL, right? So as a quick summary, Azure SQL has evolved into the world's database, you know, 
SQL is number one in the Gartner tier, right? In the Gartner quadrant, sorry. Azure SQL include virtual machine, managed instance, and Azure SQL database. To do a quick lift and shift, Azure SQL machine, if you want the power of SQL Server with the addition of platform as a service with all the benefits that we've been naming, manage instant, and if you are looking for a modern cloud application, Azure SQL Database is your choice. Let's see this in action uh, really quick. You see the screen, right? Right. Okay, so here I am in the uh, Azure portal. What I will do here is I will select my services. I would choose Azure SQL. All right. And when we go there, I will hit create and I'm going to get my first panel. In here, we can choose what we want to deploy a virtual machine, a managed instance, or an Azure SQL database. If we go to virtual machines, you can see, it. yeah. You will see that we can go from SQL Server 2008 R2, running Windows Server 2008 R2, right? Both of them are discontinued, deprecated, and you don't have support if you run it online, but if you run it in Azure, you, you may have extra support, right? And we have all the combinations of different operating systems, SQL Server versions, and editions, right? So you see that here we can go up to SQL Server 2022 Community Technical Preview running in Windows Servers 2022. As you may know, SQL Server 2017, you can run it in the Linux platform. So you can use uh, your 2017 or 19 and also 2022 when it comes uh, GA in any of the major Linux platform like Red Hat, SUSE, or Ubuntu. Right? For managed instance, we have the possibility of creating a single instance. This is what we're going to be doing right now. So I'm going to hit create, and you will see that we're going to come up with a quite nice interface here which is quite common to what we've been doing for all the others. Of course, each of them has their own, let's say, specifics, but you know, for the most common part is kind of the same. First of all, we need to um, choose our Azure, Azure subscription, right? This is um, always the same. Let's see, I remember mine. Let, let, let's forget this part for now. But we have to specify a name. Right, let's call it uh, Reactor MI01. What is going to happen here? It will uh, check if the name is in use or not. Then we have to specify on which Azure region we're going to deploy the managed instance. Right? Here we have all the all the regions in where managed instance is available let's go to east us2 for example and then we have to select compute and storage right so we go here configure managed instance and here is where we select you know the service tier if it is general purpose or if it is business critical then this this part hardware selection uh, was a, um, a, a recent change that was actually announced during build in where there are newer generation of um, CPU, right? So there are the standard series, Gen 5, premium series, and premium series memory optimized. Then Let's say we stay with the standard one. Then you have to choose the amount of virtual cores between four 
and 80 in this case, and the storage. Note that here in the storage part, we don't have to put, you know, the, the, the drives. We don't have to split in multiple drives or one drive for data, one drive for log. No, it's the total amount of storage that that we need. And something interesting to, to mention here is that you cannot choose the amount of memory that you want for your managed instance. And this is because there is a relationship between the amount of virtual cores that you select and the amount of memory. So, for example, in the standard series, for every virtual core, you will have, or for a single virtual core, you will have 5.1 run uh, a giga series, you will have seven gigs per virtual core. And in the memory optimized, you will have 13.6 gigabyte of RAM. So it's not like you can say, oh, I want just four virtual cores and three terabyte of memory, right? You have this relationship. And then it's interesting that you can, uh, you know, if you own a SQL license, right? Because you already have a contract with Microsoft uh, for that, you can use all those benefits here. And at the end of the day, the cost will be reduced in here. Then if you do backups, as I mentioned before, I mean, the service will take care of the backup, but you can say, I want my backups redundancy within the same region, meaning locally or in multiple uh, zones. This way, again, if there is a major outage of the zone, we can we can have the, the backups replicated uh, somewhere else, right? Um, then there are several things to select. We can have SQL authentication, and we have to specify here the, the sysadmin account, right? And then we move and we create the, the managed instance. Managed instance takes, you, we will see that at the end of the process, we're going to have a warning message saying this is a long running process. It could take up to six hours to create a managed instance, right? It's not the case for a virtual machine that you can have it in 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 few minutes. So this is a quick demonstration on how to create a managed instance. Then we're, now we're going to be switching to the SQL 2022 presentation, and we will connect actually to to an actual managed instance that is already deployed. As I said, if we want to deploy one right now, it's going to take six hours. So we will connect to one that already exists. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Good. Good. All right, so let's switch. Go to... Well, then here I can go to the last slide. Actually, this is the light, the one that I like to, to share. This QR code is basically uh, landing you to the actual um, Microsoft documentation and learning page. So in here, uh, it will be redirected to the main uh, Azure SQL documentation. So it's, it's quite interesting. All right, so let's switch. Here we go. This is the second part, and it's about SQL Server 2022. Uh, as I mentioned, it was announced last year in Ignite, right? But only available as private preview for you know a reduced number of community members, MVP, and customers, and where we were able to start get in touch with 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 the, the new version but then uh, during the last build conference a couple of months ago 
it was available as public preview. So everybody can download, use it, and provide feedback to Microsoft on the product. Right? So this is not you know, a separate, isolate new product that has nothing to do with the previous one. Actually, uh, most of the features are evolution of existing features, right? And in some cases, uh, as it was mentioned in the first slide, is trying to come up with the first hybrid SQL Server solution, having more integration with another component, like for example, Manage Instance, and we will see it in, in a minute. Microsoft call the, the modern SQL Server versions starting from SQL Server 2016, in where there are a set of features that are the foundation for everything that came after. In, in terms of performance, we have the introduction of Query Store. Right? Query Store is the foundation for all the other, or for most of the other per, uh, performance related feature that came in 2017, 19, and now in 2022. We will cover some of them, right? But again, the goal is basically with this query store and all the other performance related features to fulfill one of the main problems that we all have with SQL Server since day one. The problem is that thing is not like, is running slow. The problem is that when we have one, let's say, mission critical workload, what we would like is to run fast, of course, but even more important, to be stable over time. Right? Doesn't matter if the server is idle, if it is fully loaded, right? What I want is predictability. You have always things at the same time. Everybody that's been involved with SQL Server run into the problem that one day this super important report that normally runs in half an hour, we got into the office early in the morning, we grab our coffee, we sit down, and we got that phone call saying, hey, this is taking forever. We start looking for you know, some answers. Who made the change to the report? No, nobody touched it. It's been running like this without any change since I don't know how many years. So why normally takes half an hour and today it's been running for three, four hours and we have no idea what's going on. Well, this is a problem of uh, regression, SQL Server regression. When SQL Server come up with an execution plan, right? And it may have to come up with others over time. Maybe the new one is not as efficient as the previous one. And this has been a problem all the time. So with all these performance related features, Microsoft is trying to come up with something automatically, right, without any external, uh, you know, things like, for example, rewrite things to come up with the main objective, have a constant performance, and of course, trying to make it better. Well, several um, features that we see here over time, but what we're going to be focusing on right now are the ones in SQL Server 2022. Right? One of the most important one is the hybrid part, which is business continuity using availability groups or distributed availability group, that is the, the, the actual technical name, between a SQL Server 2022 and a managed instance. That means we can have a SQL Server on-prem or a virtual machine replicating with a managed instance. Not with SQL deep replication, right? With availability group. That means that eventually, if we need to do a failover, meaning that the replica that is read-write becomes read-only, and the replica that is read-only becomes read-write, meaning switching the role, is now possible with uh, you know, this link feature for managing. We're going to see it in action, and you will see that you know, till now was not possible, right? 
if you were running SQL Server, you have to do your high availability with other SQL Server. Now you can combine Managed Instance and SQL Server 2022. Then another feature that I will do a short demonstration and then Gaston will go through a little bit more is Azure Synapse Link. Azure Synapse uh, Analytics is the new analytic platform, right? Uh, that is the evolution of, of Azure SQL Data Warehouse with asteroids, right? Many asteroids actually. Um, it's an analytic platform, right? So to do analytics, what we need to do historically, actually today too, we have to come up with this ETL process to extract and load the data from our operational system into our warehouse, right? With this feature, Azure Synapse Link, what Microsoft is allowing us for the very first time in SQL Server 2022 to extract and replicate data in almost real time between our operational tables and our data warehouse. So this will remove the need of an ETL, right? quite instantly. So we will be able to do analytics with Synapse Analytics and visualization with Power BI with real time data. Right? Super interesting. Then the whole governance with Microsoft PureView and the integration in order for us to get more insight of the data that we already have in our databases, right? And do the actual discovery of not, you know, the, the, the data in terms of columns, data types, or those kind of things. It's more like the data as an entity, as a business entity, right? So we can have this global catalog of data, right? And the integration between PureView and SQL Server 2022 is quite seamless, right? Then SQL Server Ledger. This is a quite interesting feature because for the very first time you can integrate the uh, powerful of uh, cryptography with SQL Server. It's kind of a integration with its own blockchain, let's say, with SQL Server. It's quite interesting because it will allow you to create certain type of new tables with cryptographic, cryptographic information, and you won't be able to alter that, data, that table, that data, even if you are the DBA, the sysadmin, right? And if you have external auditing and you need to demonstrate that the data was not modified by anyone, there are mechanisms that will easily allow you and demonstrate that this data was never touched. Right? So quite, quite interesting. And then in terms of uh, performance, right, more and more features at the top of Query Store to accomplish the goal that I mentioned before. So, Definitely now SQL Server 2022 is the center of this hybrid war with integration with the new security things, with what I said, the leisure part, connected with PureView and Managed Instance, and also Synapse and Power BI. Way more intelligence in the performance area. Uh, enhancement in the T-SQL language, right, to better handle uh, non-structured, non-relational data like JSON, right, and you also T-SQL functions to do our jobs easier when we have to develop. Also, something quite interesting is the integration of SQL Server 22 with modern data store. Right? We will see something in a minute. This is another view of what we just said earlier. So Microsoft is not trying to release just new feature. It's just trying to resolve real life problems, right? So 
Today, we have a challenge. It's extremely difficult to set up and maintain a disaster recovery environment, right? Well, with this new feature, right, we can synchronize, right, really easily, user databases between SQL Server 2022 and managed instance. There are other enhancements in the high availability area, like, for example, um, I don't have it here, but it's the contain availability group. Right? Contain availability group is for the very first time we are going to be able not only to replicate user databases, but we also going to have the logins and the sys objects replicated to multiple instances. Right? So today we have the data replicated, but if we need to access, we need to manually move the logins, move the SQL shops, and so on and so forth. With this, with contain availability group, we will have all together in the same box. The other uh, problem or challenge, ETLs are expensive, they get out of date quickly, right, and affect the operational workload, you know, because of the performance that we need. With Azure Synapse Link, we can do this replication in almost real time. Okay, so let's see these two features in action really quick. Okay. Here I have a virtual machine running SQL Server 2022 CTP 2.0. Right. First of all, how do we do to create a distributed availability group between SQL Server 2022 and a managed instance? We go to the high availability part, sorry, here, and there is one um, my glasses. We get one database, for example, and we have this new um, option called Azure SQL Managed Link. We have two options, to start the replication or to do the actual failover from one to the other. By the way, in order to have this, you also have to download the new preview version of the latest Management Studio 19. So we go here, we said replicate database, right? And what we need to do here is basically some validations that it will check for your SQL Server and your managed instance. For example, you need to have these two trade flags um, in your system, right? So, and, and here you can go uh, to the documentation. Basically, the trade flag 9567 uh, is doing some sort of compression, and, and this one is optimizing the, the, the flow between the data that gets replicated. So, what we're going to be doing here is we do uh, the BCC trace on and trace on and we put this and so once we enable this we come back to the wizard which is rerun and we have everything we need ready then we select which are the databases that we want to put within the uh, replication. In this case, we have this one available. Right. Then we have to sign to our Azure subscription basically to see all the uh, managed instances that we have available, and then we just select the instance and the replication start. I won't go farther here and I will show you uh, 
that I already have one created. So if I go to my high availability part, I have my local availability group and my distribute availability group already created with that wisdom. So, and now, what can we do with all this? Well, I will demonstrate you that this is replicating. Here I am on my SQL Server 2022, and I have this table in the demo DB sample table CSV. I'm just doing uh, a select, and I have this amount of row, right? And see here that the first ID I have is 5,000. When I go to my read-only replica in the managed instance, I do the same select to the table and I have exactly the same information, right? It's interesting because this is a read-only replica. So if eventually I would like to delete something, it will say, you cannot do it because this is a read-only database. And this is because it's synchronizing with the other. At the same time, remember the other feature that we discussed, um, the integration with Synapse Analytic. Here I am connected to, I will show you here, I have my SQL Server 2022, my managed instance here, and my dedicated SQL pool in Synapse. The three of them connected in Management Studio. Right? So, if I do again the select in my SQL pool, I see the same information. So I will go to my SQL server and what I will do here is I will delete all the IDs that are smaller than 6,000. So this is my read write uh, replica SQL server. this amount of information and starting with the ID 6000. When I go to my read-only replica in the managed instance, right? Now I see the same data because again, it's replicating asynchronously, but replicating. And if I go to the Synapse pool, right? And I do a select of my table that is in the warehouse, I see exactly the same information, right? So here I can delete even more, right? So here I'm starting from the ID 100,000. And when we come here, we see it right away. In the Azure Synapse link, it may take a little bit longer, but in this case, it just replicate right away, right? So super, super uh, graphically, you can see how you can do a change in your primary and have your data replicated to the managed instance with distributed availability group and to uh, uh, Azure SQL pool in Synapse. So let's go back. To the presentation. These are, you know, all the components that we have in what is called intelligent query processing, right? This is basically something that Microsoft has been doing since 2017, basically giving you the possibility that the SQL Server engine will now take care of adjusting the execution plan on the fly, right? Before this was completely static, once it was compiled and generated and stored into the, 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 the store the, on the cache, right? Now there are different options or different scenarios in where after executing the query, if there is something that needs to be improved, right, in that area, SQL Server will do it for you, right? So one of the most important thing to mention or the new challenge, query tuning is quite expensive and time consuming, right? With query store, 
now enabled for the very first time in SQL Server by default on every single user database when you create one. Right? Remember that in Manage Instance, in Azure SQL Database, when you create a database, Query Store is enabled by default. Right? Now in SQL Server 2022, it's going to also happen the same. Mm -hmm. So there are new things that uh, are really interesting that are trying to solve problems that we have since many times. For example, we know that setting the degree of parallelism is always challenging, and there are several ways to do it, but you know, depending to who you talk to, the number may change. Right? Well, now single server will automatically, after executing a specific workload, a specific store procedure, will say, hey, I believe that adjusting the max DOP to this other value will be useful. And it will do it for you right away for that specific query that is executing, not for all the instance. Right? It will change it. It will verify if it is better or not. And if it is, it will stick with that for other executions. Same thing for cardinal estimation feedback, CE feedback. If any of the store procedure that you are running in your system may be benefit by, for, you know, by using a, a, a query hint, right? Today you have to go open the store procedure and enter the hint manually and recompile the procedure. Now, using the power of query store, you can do it on the fly without changing the code because the intelligent query processing will um, take care for, for, for you. Parameter sensitive plan, PSP optimization. This is really interesting because for the very first time, it's taking a way better approach for the um, uh, uh, parameter sniffing problem. Right? You can have now multiple uh, plans per query ID depending on the parameter that you enter. So really interesting uh, approach. So again, this is quite easy to have it implemented. You should install SQL Server and use the latest compatibility level 160 and you will have all these features on. Parameter sensitive plan optimization, one of the beauties of the intelligent query processing PNX, as I said, you may have one store procedure that you have secured it with one parameter. For the very first time, it will come up with a plan. But then, if for the subsequent execution, if you use a different parameter that may require a different plan, it has to stick to the one that is in the cache. Now, with PSP optimization, you can have two different plans for the same store procedure. It's not for only one procedure, for only one, let's say, parameter. It's for a range of parameters. And for this first version, uh, I believe it's only for, for one parameter, but you know, it's getting better. Huh? So to make a sum, if you have one store procedure that with one parameter may require an index six, but for all parameters may require an index n, you will have for the same query ID, two plans. Right? And it will use the one that the system considers that is more accurate to the input parameter that you are using. Right? It's, it's, it's an interesting concept because, again, just having in mind that you know two plans or multiple plans for the same query ID. Uh, but again, it's, it's getting really, really good and Again, the main goal is solve the uh, parameter uh, sniffing problem that uh, you know started way back. I will skip this demo, so we move on here with the security part, right? A lot of uh, investment in the security, scalability, and availability with SQL Server Leisure that I mentioned, and we will see a, a quick demo here. Something quite important hands-free 10 dB, same as DOP. Uh, it's quite challenging to set up the 10 dB, the number of files and these kind of things. Well, 
Microsoft is now trying to get this to this approach of hands-free 10 dB and in the availability in availability space contained availability groups. Right? SQL Server Leisure, right? Is this new set of tables that will have uh, the power of blockchain in SQL Server, so you will have a trusted storage, right? So any, you know, auditing thing can confirm that the 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 data has not been tampered. We will see it in action with a with a quick demo. So, what I'm doing here is creating a brand new database, DemoDB Ledger. Dropping the schema, dropping everything, and this is the important part. I will be creating a table, right, with the option ledger on, append only. So here, even if I am sysadmin on my SQL Server, I can only append data. So I create. Yeah. So now my table key cards event is empty. I can insert a new row to my table, right? Then I do the select. I see here. When I go to my ledger table, is the same table with the underscore ledger option. We'll see at what time, who did the operation, right? And which is the data that in this case was inserted. Let's say I want to do an update of this information because someone wants to, you know, fake the the entry, even if it is uh, a sysadmin. I'm getting an error. Updates are not allowed for a pen-only leisure table. And if I want to check and confirm, I am sysadmin. Right. So not even the DBAs are going to be able to tamper the data on this table. Yeah. But with tracking all that, what impact does that have if the system has to do a wall back or some transaction? Or does it only get written once the transaction is fully completed? It's it's when it, the transaction is fully completed. It's a transaction. It's, it's SQL Server, right? So it's a transaction. Of, system so when the transaction get committed it's also get committed this information as well mm -hmm. then we have another type of tables which we may do uh, modifications in here so i'm creating this table which in this case the option is history table so we're going to create an, a, a history table here with leisure on so i do create my table right here we will see that my table is there with the name of the ledger table i will insert 
one value here, and then I will insert another three values. When I go check my ledger table, this is my table, you see what I just inserted. So let's say that now I want to modify the, the balance number for the customer ID number one. Instead of being 50, it's going to be 100. Now I'm allowed to do it. But if I go to my ledger table here, I see all the activity on that table. Right? When it was an insert, update, delete, who did it, at what time, uh, and so on and so forth. You have all the activity here that is some sort of auditing. If I delete one row, you can delete it, right? But, you know, for the auditing purposes, you will also have it here that this row was deleted. And also you have the, the initial information that was deleted as well. So quite interesting concept, right? This is actually available in, in Azure SQL as well. So uh, quite interesting. More and more features in SQL Server 2022, right? In terms of, you know, handling external uh, file system or, or modern storage system, uh, what else? XML compression, auto drop statistic, quite, quite interesting, enhancements in the in-memory OLTP. So a lot of things coming. Another challenge, I need to access data on a modern storage system through SQL, right? So from SQL Server, we can access data that is, for example, stored in a storage account, in a specific container, in a data lake, say with as Parquet, JSON, or CSV, right? Not only in the Microsoft Cloud, but also in other standard storage. So this way, from SQL, we can access the, this data with no problem. We can also do a backup and restore to this external modern uh, object storage system. I don't want to learn a new language and get the new features. Right? So again, at the top of SQL Server, new enhancements. I had a demo for this, we're going to skip it. So again, a quick summary, SQL Server 2022 is the first Azure enabled uh, option for disaster recovery, analytics, and security. Build it intelligence is getting better and better. A lot of innovation in the security, scalability, and availability area, data virtualization and object storage, and still doing uh, improvement in the T-SQL language. Mm -hmm. With that, I will go to my last A slide. Any questions? No, some of it is over my head, but I'm processing it. Yeah, it's a lot of information, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, in my case, as an MVP and also as a Microsoft customer with a great relationship with the SQL Server uh, engineering product, right? Uh, they used to quote me a lot, especially in the uh, performance related new features because we have early access and we test and validate our workload with new SQL Server version. Again, here, the links for the documentation for SQL Server 2022 and for Azure SQL Fundamentals. And no, here my contact information for additional questions. And with that, I finished the first part of the presentation, which is more related to the operational part. Now I hand it over to my good friend Gaston. Actually, I did have one quick thing. Mm -hmm. With all of that tracking, mm -hmm. what impact does that have on storage? Uh, and you said storage in, like, in which you're, level? You're in taking, in taking it into account. Like and you have to create a you have to do some changes to your database. You have to create a, a specific uh, ledger uh, 
compatible uh, file system, not file system. Uh, um, so, so like when you're thinking of um, for the local storage, so when you're thinking about, hey, I'm using this feature, mm -hmm. you definitely have to take into account the impact it's going to have to like your storage environment. Yeah. I, I'll tell you something. All these features, query store, ledger, you name it, they will have an impact in the performance, right? But the benefit uh, is guaranteed that, you know, it will uh, surpass the, 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 you know, the additional, let's say, load that you will have in your system, right? That, that's for sure. All right. Uh, you're going to connect with USB-C, is that one? USB -C. Yeah. And, oh, and another thing, you're using the term query store. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's just the graphical. No, the. Yep. Uh, no, query store is basically uh, a feature that you have to enable at user database uh, level, right? That basically will keep track of every single plan change and runtime statistic for all the workload that you have in that specific user database, right? Actually, it's uh, the asteroids for the query performance tuning, right? Okay. Because you are not only keeping track of all the changes and the runtime statistic. For example, you run one store procedure for the very first time, and then you run it another hundred times, you're going to get the plan that you will see it in the query store. Okay. But then that you run it hundred times, it the minimum execution time, average, maximum, etc. Right. And with that, you can, you know, then you don't have only one store procedure. You have many. You can have your dashboard within query store saying which are the most expensive queries, and then you do the tuning uh, for for that, right? Also in Query Store, it will keep track of all the plan change, right? Over time, and eventually, if you detect that one has a, a regression, you can go and manually force a plan, right? Yeah. In SQL Server 2017, they added an additional layer to Query Store, which is automatic query tuning that if you enable it at the top of query store for a specific one or multiple user database, if the system detects that it was a regression for any of the workload on your user database, it will automatically set the last known good plan. So even if it happened at 3 a.m. in the morning, if you are not in front of your query store dashboard, if you have this feature, right, it will happen right away. It's incredible and again, all these things help you to accomplish this main goal of stability of your workload along the way. Good. Thank you. Sure. Well, so in my case, I'm going to play kind of a different role than Javier. I'm not going to go on the SQL DBA mindset. I'm going to go with the more the data engineer and data visualization mindset in terms of how we can bring up to speed and linking all the concepts that Javier bring to the table in terms of SQL 2022. I'm going to try to provide a little bit of insights of two main frameworks across Synapse and Power BI. So in our case, going to the Synapse layer, I'm going to talk around what is Synapse Analytics, what is bring to the table, and then go over a little bit of how data engineers and data architects can start working on Synapse framework. So Synapse is not just data warehouse, it's a whole platform. So behind the scenes, Synapse is based on Azure Data Lake from what the power platform side of things called common data model, dataverse behind the scenes, and actually, Synapse is integrate with all of them. So we can just with a couple of clicks 
bring the Ashurdra Lake, read everything that happens in the Dira Lake stream, and start creating all kind of searchable concepts and start exploring the data in the raw format of Data Lake and bring external tables, bring SQL pools, serverless dedicated, and then adding a little bit of insights on exploration for Spark serverless. So if we need to explore data using PySpark or different language from more the data scientist side of things, we can do that in the Synapse layer. So the platform is itself and the component of the platform, we have data integration, we have the runtimes of SQL and Spark running in Synapse, so we can start choosing, okay, I need this run in T-SQL, or I need this run in Python, or Scala, or .NET, and I can start exploring data in that format. I have two different storage modes, dedicated and serverless, and I can start using different languages to explore my data. So that is a little bit of Synapse Studio. I have all what we call the hub. The hub is a one single place where you can find management, security, monitoring of data, meta store, and we can start different workloads on that scale. This is the main Synapse Studio framework where we can find all our hub in terms of data development, integrations, monitoring, and managing. Starting with the home hub, we have all this framework where we can define if we want to explore data and go into the data uh, exploration structure, and we can explore structure or unstructured data. We can develop our business logics using, using SQL scripts, notebooks, data flows. We can create pipelines so the exactly same framework that we can land with Data Factory, we can do the same framework in Synapse. We can do the whole ingestion framework across Synapse, and we can monitor all their resource in one single place. We can start speeding up what we can do in Synapse, and we can start learning a little bit of the whole Synapse Studio. That is pretty easy because we have a knowledge center, so we can start using samples, a lot of scripts that we can reuse directly. We can browse the gallery and we have plenty of data sets there to explore. And we have a whole Synapse Studio framework. This is a little bit of, you know, different samples that we can, and I usually advise everyone to jump right away into this knowledge center because it's so easy to start speeding up the process of learning the whole Synapse Studio. We can go there and start looking at some data sets of samples like, you know, COVID data or, you know, New York City taxi uh, framework, and we can speed up the process in terms of, okay, let's bring this data set, let's open that in the Synapse Studio and let's start exploring the data right away and even create data sets and start doing ingestion just to learn a little bit of the capabilities of the framework. This is a little bit of, you know, the home hub from the hub itself. So the main window, the main Synapse Studio framework, we can go there and from the home option, we can start creating a new SQL script, a new notebook in Spatch Spark, a new data flow, uh, a new Power BI report. That is pretty amazing for me. You know, if you connect Synapse and Power BI, it's just two clicks and you create a link service. So you don't need to, as a data engineer, I don't need to create the connections to the data lake, explore the data, and then create the data set and push to Power BI. You can do everything in Synapse in one single place. So even if I am doing a small POC for a client and I need to explore data and push right away to create a new Power BI report, 
I can do everything in Synapse. I don't need to go and say to the business, OK, I need to create a workspace for you, and then I'm going to push our new report. I can do everything in the Synapse layer and even working as a Power BI developer in the Synapse uh, instance. So that is kind of amazing for me. It's kind of a not open multiple tabs or multiple windows at the same time and doing the whole data architect, data engineer, and Power BI development experience in one single place. I'm going to explore a little bit about that later. This is a little bit of what we expect to explore in the data stream or the data hub in Synapse. So this is kind of amazing for me in terms of we can explore data in multiple formats. So we can have SQL pools dedicated, serverless, all in one single place, and I can explore all the databases, even if we are talking about dedicated or serverless, but even I can explore Spark serverless in the same place. And at the same time, I have the link service, so I can even explore all my data lake raw data from the same place. So I can say, OK, I have a bunch of parquet files, and then explore the parquet files that I land into the data lake, and I can go to the same place to, to do the exploration. And the exploration could be just running a SQL script or running a Spark script and Python script and load a data frame and then explore the data in the same way. You know, So it's kind of interesting the scenario of for the data engineer, do whatever you want in any language that you want to use, T-SQL, Python, Scala. You know? uh, and the other topic that is really great is that this data hub is integrated with, as I mentioned, dedicated SQL, serverless, Spark, linking to data lake, but also explore a little bit more in terms of if I have a streaming data flow coming from, let's say, our streaming like even have IoT have real-time streaming data, I can link right away from Synapse with Azure Data Explorer and land the data in Azure Data Explorer and then explore the data directly in Synapse. So there's a link right away to Azure Data Explorer. So if I have real-time streaming data landing into Data Explorer, I can get the link service here see all in real time, and then maybe define a scope where I can say, OK, all the data coming to Data Explorer, I want to have a scope where I land the data into Azure SQL or you know, dedicated or serverless. This is how it feels to start exploring data in the Data Hub. As I can see here is, we can link to Cosmos DB, we can link to Azure Data Explorer, we can link to Data Lake, and I start exploring data. In this case, raw data in parquet format, I can explore all of them directly from the same data hub. And I can run new notebooks, new SQL scripts to explore the data directly from the, the same place. This is a little bit of examples of what we can do, you know, it's kind of a running SQL scripts and the SQL scripts is right away open data and accessing data into the data lake. In this case, the format could be Parquet, could be CSV, could be whatever format we have in the, in the data lake. So we can explore data running a new SQL script. I can do exactly the same running a PySpark and load the data into the data frame and then display the data coming from the same data lake storage. And I can do bulk loads of the data. So if I want to create, let's say, an external table, I can do that right away. I can connect and run in and connect with an integration runtime that allow me to load data from the data lake into dedicated pool or from uh, 
the ADLS to the, the serverless pool. In this case, just a little bit of example of how I can create an external table directly from the reading of the data or the exploration of the data into the data lake. So I can run just a command to create an external table and plan the data right away into my SQL serverless pool or dedicated pool. And as I can see, you know, in the same place, I can get all the sense of how many databases I have into my dedicated SQL pool, different databases that land into the serverless SQL pool, and some notebooks that I create as a Spark database into my Apache Spark serverless pool. So that is an option that is all available in one single place. I can see all the databases there. I can kind of start in a, pro, a, a, a new table, load to a data frame, and I can see everything in the same uh, data hub place. In this case, it's a little bit of integration. You know, it's kind of a not only I can explore data and create external tables, I can create pipelines right away in Synapse. So I can start doing business logic and map data and say, OK, I want to connect with the data lake. I want to manipulate the data, transform the data, clean the data, get uh, maybe mapping of data, create some kind of change in some schemas, and then dump the data or sync the data into different places. So that is doable directly into what we call the pipelines and the integration data have in Synapse. So that is doable right away in Synapse. I don't need to go to open a data factory instance or data bricks cluster to do that, you know. The develop hub is pretty interesting because allow us to kind of create kind of the business logic right away into the Synapse. And I can run scripts in SQL, notebooks, data flows, or even Power Queries directly in the Develop Hub. So we can query, analyze, and do the modeling of the data in just a few clicks. In this case, just an example is kind of a running a new SQL script right away in the Develop uh, place and at the same time I can choose my preferred language and say okay I want to run this in a notebook using PySpark or Scala or C Sharp you know, Spark SQL right away directly to create that transformation layer so I can choose my preferred language to do that. This is another example of the develop have we can handle that pipeline process and do the mapping and create new columns and whatever I need to do in terms of joins, unions, or the right columns, directly creating a mapping data flow into the data hub. So that is pretty interesting in terms of the data engineer can provide kind of a low code or no code, you know, pipeline process within Synapse. So I, I, don't, I don't need to run any single line of code to do this mapping data flow. And I can map in, filter, and just land data into another uh, place. Pretty interesting, the link that we have with Power BI. So the link is just a couple of clicks where you can go to the home page of Synapse. You can create a link service to the Power BI. It's going to ask only for your tenant ID. And it's going to, with a single sign on, manage identity is going to provide a link into Power BI workspace. You can link for multiple workspace. You can start with one and then you can create multiple link services. And what it's going to do is allow Synapse to connect to Power BI right away. So every time I create a new external table, or I start exploring data into Synapse, I create SQL scripts 
or a pipeline process, align the data into new tables, and then I can create a data set, and that data set is going to be pushed into Power BI, and that allow me to create a new report right away in the Synapse scenario. So I don't need to go to Power BI and go back to the Synapse layer. I can create the Power BI report right away from Synapse. This is the experience. This is not Power BI. It is Power BI, but it's the Power BI service embed experience into the Synapse layer. So what I'm doing here is I open my Synapse Studio. I create just link service. I start creating multiple external tables. Let's say digging data from Data Explorer, combining them with uh, Data Lake, and then create a couple of matrix views in the Synapse layer. And then I create the data set in the Synapse layer and push that data set into my Power BI tenant. And I start creating a report right away from Synapse. And this is going to be syncing automatically with the Power BI service, what means that if I have someone from the business asking for the new sales report, I can say, OK, I just push the report to your Power BI service and to your Power BI workspace. And they're going to see right away what I'm seeing right now here in the Synapse Studio screen. So long story short, I can, from Synapse, I can create Power BI report right away. I just need to define a name. I'm going to have my blank screen here connecting to the data set in Synapse, and I can push right away the new report experience right away to the Power BI service. Another great concept in Synapse, I can link the Synapse pipeline or develop uh, frameworks to do CI CD. So that means that I can connect with GitHub, I can connect with Azure DevOps, and I can push all my branch from the Synapse uh, environments to different uh, releases and stages from the development uh, framework. So I can connect with GitHub and then I can push those changes into the different layers or, or environments. The integration is really great in terms of that we have more than, at this point, more than 100 connectors. That means that I can connect with data from multiple systems, not only from Microsoft. I can connect with multiple sources like Teradata, Oracle, and SAP, and different systems. So we can get link services connecting to our Synapse layer and orchestrate all this kind of transformation that can be happening directly in my Synapse layer. I can connect right away Synapse on, or also with Azure Machine Learning. That means that I can do predictive analysis from here. In the Synapse layer, I also have the monitor half. That, that means that I can monitor in every single pipeline that runs into my Synapse developer half. I can trigger any new pipeline, I can connect with on-premises systems. If I have a SQL on-premises or Oracle on-premises or Teradata on-premises, I can connect with all those systems on-premises via the uh, SHIR, and I can monitor all of them in one single place. This is what it looks like to see a whole monitoring framework running. I can see all the SQL pools and what is happening, what is online, what is post, and the same happens with the Apache Spark pools. I can see everything that happens behind the scenes, even if we are talking about dedicated or serverless pools. This is a little bit of the management of the hub, what is going on in terms of the pools that runs in my framework. And I can see the built-in, the dedicated, and see what are the sizing, what is the, 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 the status of the pools that I'm running in my Synapse framework. 
And then, uh, as I mentioned before, we have more than 100 connectors at this point where I can link with so many systems in terms of uh, consuming data coming from REST APIs, from SAP, from QuickBooks or different system, Postgre information, you know, so we can create link services to bring data up to speed and land data into uh, the Synapse layer. This is, as I mentioned before, this is the way we can connect with on-premises. We can uh, either way uh, use the Azure uh, integration runtime or we can create a SHIR service integration random if we want to connect with on-premises systems. This is a little bit of access control. We have a cool space where we can define different roles and assignments for each of the groups that need access to the Synapse layer. So we can start defining, okay, which type of access your group need. And I can start asking, okay, are you going to do more Apache's Spark exploration or you need more the SQL side of things or you need more kind of a guidance for your data engineer streams to create new pipelines. So we can start defining Azure Active Directory groups and then define what type of access based on the role that they are going to have inside our Synapse layer. As I mentioned before, the GitHub uh, integration or Azure DevOps integration is right away. It's kind of a few clicks where you can create your repo structure and then connect right away your repo structure with the Synapse layer. And then it's going to be a seamless connection between all your pipelines and then using the branching structure to push any change to your uh, dev, QA, or prod environment. Then a little bit of, you know, the serverless SQL pool, you know, we have logical data warehousing, so we can connect. And Power BI, I feel that in this case, we should be talking more Power BI, not just for the visualization tool. We can use Power BI in this case from premium standpoint, we can use Power BI Premium as a semantic layer, so we can define if the, depends on the use case, of course, but you can choose to have all the semantic layer in actual running services or using Power BI Premium to do that. And Power BI can access the logical data warehouse and that logical data warehouse is gonna be pushed with all data coming from the Azure the Lake uh, storage. So in this case, this is a little bit of what we call the logical data warehouse views, where we can create views that they are connecting directly to uh, in, in accessing all the data from the CSV files that we have in the data lake. And Power BI is going to be, is going to be connect to that view to access the data. So in this case, this is going to be a really great performance where Power BI is accessing the data because it's not accessing directly to the data lake storage. It's accessing to a view that we create as a logical data warehouse, and the logical data warehouse itself is using the open row set statement to access all the data in the CSV format into the data lake. So in this case, we are just creating that kind of layer where Power BI is accessing just a view and the view is accessing the data lake storage uh, data. A little bit of the pipeline process is just in the orchestration inside Synapse Analytics, we create a new pipeline and the new pipeline concept allow us to create a virtual data set. The virtual data set is nothing rather than the connection to any of the data sources. Could be Redshift, could be Data Explorer, could be Data Lake, could be Cosmos DB. And then you can create the pipeline spills. 
what about Power BI? Power BI is kind of the another the other layer that allow us to connect to data. And this is just a framework of the Power BI service showing the connection to multiple data uh, at the same time. One of the great things around this is that at this point, you can connect Power BI with Synapse, but at the same time, let's say you want to hit the other way. You want to, from Power BI, let's say that you have a business user that they want to access data that lands in Synapse, but at the same time, they want to do some kind of forecasting or modeling or doing a little bit of what if a scenario. So what is great at this point is that you can create your report in Power BI. Let's say that you create a simple power up and embed that of things, and that power up, power up can allow me to create the forecasting and trigger store procedures into my Synapse layer to write back the data of the forecasting. So I can start connecting the dots between all the platform frameworks. What I mean is Power Apps allow me to create scenarios. And this is kind of a uh, client story. They, they actually asked me that, asked me to do something that allow me to start playing with forecasting. That CFO of the company, he doesn't want to others to see their own forecasting. So they ask me to provide role level security for forecasting scenarios where he wants to be able to create scenarios, create the forecasting, save in there in his own profile, and then save it to the Synapse layer. So that is totally doable. And here connecting the dots was Power Apps, a little bit of Power Automate, trigger the store procedures, send the data to Synapse via store procedures, and the Power BI report is using that query. That means that it's refreshing automatically when I write data back into the Synapse layer. So that is a pretty interesting scenario where you can see a little bit of what is doable connecting all the frameworks together. Power BI at this point is more like not just the visualization layer. Power BI at this point is kind of a semantic layer accessing data, accessing data from everywhere, from any data services, any on-premises systems, and giving us the option to start showing data into the visualization layer, but it's too much in terms of what Power BI is bringing in terms of the semantic modeling between the data warehousing layer and the visualization layer. So we can push that kind of concept when we start talking about Power BI as a premium uh, framework and scenario uh, for our end users. A little bit of what is doable at this point with Power BI in the service itself. I have a whole UI that allow me to do the ETL. So if I still need more cleansing or transformation of data, I can do that right away in the service. So there's a really, really great concept that the Power BI team almost they show that kind of concept few months yeah, a few months from, from now, the concept is Data Mart. Uh, the Data Mart concept is you can create your own simple, small data warehouse in the service where you need a little bit of more cleansing of the data and the way the data engineer stream is serving you the data maybe is not the right option for you in terms of the transformation and the mapping so you can create the data mart concept directly using the power bi service and create your small data mart 
then hit a data set and then create your report from there. So that is a really great concept to kind of go to that layer between the data engineer streams and the uh, business uh, consumers of the report. No? Exploration of data is coming almost from everywhere in terms of it's not just kind of a bring a lot of insights in Power BI. Then we have the option to start looking a little bit of, you know, the next step or the next phase in terms of understanding our data and start asking questions in natural language, create decision trees, create uh, Canvas that allow us to read the report right away with just a custom visual. So we can add one visual that allow us, and this is too much for me in terms of bringing accessibility to our reports. So if I have some business users that need to understand the data that we are showing in our report, the Power BI team did a really amazing job in terms of bringing just one visual that allow to read all that happens in the report, analyze the information, and bring kind of a summary of that table up to speed in Power BI. Visualization that at this point, they are kind of a, not just kind of a, the the native visualization, we have a whole marketplace in terms of looking at some really great custom visuals that they are totally open to download and with the whole certification process around custom visuals so we can use them right away in our report. And finally, the Power BI desktop experience is really great because with one free tool, we can start, you know, sharing the way we can go and understand the life cycle of any Power BI new report. And what I mean with this is explaining to a business user that is just quick as download Power BI desktop and start, you know, getting the data, create your data set, working on relationships or modeling, placing the data, and then create your report, and then finally publish your report to the service to understand how it goes to the end-to-end, -end, you know, solution in terms of creating the report and publish and share that report with any broader audience. The mobile at this point is kind of amazing for me in terms of, you know, not only bring the reports, in one native uh, mobile app. Also at this point, and based on my experience, all the C-level of companies, they love the idea of metrics and goals and targets and see all the alerts that I can have right away in my mobile phone, just setting the goals for any team that I have and say, okay, if this team is behind the target in X percent sent me an alert. So they don't even need to open the Power BI app. They're going to have a trigger alert in the cell phone saying, OK, you have a new goal that is behind your uh, target. So they're going to just receive a push notification and they can just right away even even they don't need to open the Power BI report. They are going to go directly to another experience that is the Power BI goals experience that is just KPIs, just KPIs with big numbers that they are going to show, okay, this was your sales target for this quarter and for this team, and they are behind in 10% at this point. And even we can go further and say, add me to that goal some AI capabilities. If they're going to reach the goal, go in the same pace within the sales. So 
I can say, if we go doing exactly the same at this pace, we are not going to end up the Q3 quarter with the right numbers. So I can get the trigger alert right away now. This is pretty scary. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a little bit of you know the experience, the vulnerability services, all the artifacts coming together. Uh, another thing that I didn't add in this slide, but I would love to add that one, is that even when we talk around low code platforms like Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, I can do a bunch of automation behind the scenes. What I mean here is I've been hearing from multiple clients that they've been asking at this point after seven years in production with Power BI, they start growing as kind of enterprise clients and they've been asking Gaston, I need help because at this point, I'm really scared what is gonna happen if someone says, move all your tenant, the Power BI to Asia, to Europe, to, you know, different regions. And if I need to move all my artifacts, I, I prefer to leave the company, you know? Uh, so what I mean here is I can, use the REST API of Power BI and create pipelines that allow me to do the full automation process. If I need to back up all my data sets, reports, gateways, you know, and move them to another region, I can do that directly creating pipelines in Azure DevOps. Could be PowerShell scripts and then create all these backups and moving to another region. So that is pretty cool at this point. It's pretty awesome in terms of what the Power BI service is exposing more and more in terms of REST API. In the workspace, uh, this is a great experience in terms of it's pretty easy to access any workspace in Power BI, but more for me is the experience of, and this is again, another client story is that because we are in that maturity level where Power BI is being seven years in production, at this point, I've been hearing more and more from our clients asking for help in terms of Gaston, I need to organize a little bit the mess that I have here in terms of the governance. Create for me a center of excellence in terms of how I am collaborating across all my company, how I've been doing things in terms of strategy, how I pitch the knowledge sharing in my company, how I, how everyone in my company knows that I have a one single Power BI community. Directly go for Q&A, go to this place if you need a new Power BI Pro license, need uh, a new workspace, this is the right form to complete. So. I can do that directly creating a center of excellence that allow me to embed all the Power BI experience across my company. This is a little bit of the visual experience in Power BI, creating right away visuals is pretty easy, it's pretty seamless. And from my end, that's gonna be all. I think we are almost on time. I think I kind of have that in my mind and I don't want to go over uh, with that with a demo on all of these things because I feel that you know I what I my main goal today was kind of explaining how to connect the dots in terms of what Javier explained before in terms of more the SQL side of things and then connecting SQL with Synapse and open a little bit the mind of what is doable across the platform of Synapse and how Synapse is connecting directly to Power BI as pushing data sets and collaborate creating reports right away from that platform and that, that experience. So thank you to be here. Thank you to spend all the time with us today. Uh, hope that we are recording the session and then later 
everyone from the community can see that offline. And I'm really excited to be here again in person and say hi, you know, again. So thank you, Rebecca, for the invitation and the host us. <laughs>